So, um, so Eliezer asked me to um, give this presentation because I understand this is sort of bringing together both CGSI and um, and the beginning of the um, the uh, big program for the summer. And you know, particularly since since he and I. Um, have developed this sort of subtrack of, of big focused on genomics and uh, brain health. He asked me to talk about the Depression Grand Challenge. And so I'm going to talk about it because really what the Depression Grand Challenge is, aside from many other things, um, which I will give you some introduction about, is it really is UCLA's big data initiative for brain health. Um, and, um, and so I think you can look at it from that standpoint. And so I wanted to talk to you about the Depression Grand Challenge in the context of Grand Challenges. Because I, I think particularly for students and particularly for undergraduates, um, I think this is really an important question, which is why do humans need Grand Challenges? Um, uh, you know, it's something that has really taken hold over the last few years as a concept everywhere, you know, from uh, Obama administration to the Gates Foundation you know, to all kinds of other places. And, and, and really, I think that, that there are two reasons why we need grand challenges. The first is that is obvious to everyone. We have some societal problems which are so huge and so complex that they can't possibly be solved except by some really overwhelming concerted team effort. And at the same time, um, both our individual psychologies and um, our reward structures act against solving these kinds of problems. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious, you know, you can only read the news for 10 seconds to see why it's so hard to do this because there's so many people that really don't want to solve large problems. I mean, um, you know, starting with our president and, and you know, going <laughs> throughout. Um, but, but, but the reason why, you know, that's successful is because it really goes against the way that we think, which is to solve what is right in front of our nose and that goes both in terms of our own you know, wish to survive, but it's also manifested in our whole reward structure. And you know, all the faculty know this, basically. We're rewarded to get individual grants to focus on problems, which we've probably already done over 50% of the work to show that they can be done. So therefore, there are things that are eminently solvable, but for the most part, we all know that we don't tend to work on the things that we consider like that would really strain our intelligence and creativity the most to do them. I mean, we try to do as much as we can, but that's not what we get rewarded for. And so the whole issue of individual versus team efforts, single discipline versus cross discipline. Um, again, um, you know, there's, there's lip service paid to the idea that solving big problems requires working cross disciplines. And, you know, and I think um, endeavors like these two that we're bringing together here are, you know, are trying to do something about it. But it's really, really hard to work across disciplines. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a, a data scientist, but I've spent my whole career working really closely with data scientists. And I know it, you know, it's like, um, it's like a marriage that you honestly have to work at it all the time to be able to communicate properly. And so again, it's really against what comes naturally to us. Um, we tend to work on really short horizons versus, you know, almost anything that's really important to solve is not going to get solved except over a long term horizon. Um, and so grand challenges is something that really is a framework for tackling huge problems. And once you say that something is a grand challenge, you can get people to buy into the idea of doing something different from what they ordinarily do. And that's really incredibly important for something like, for example, the depression grand challenge which has faculty and students and postdocs now from over 20 different departments because you can only get those kind of people to sort of buy into something that they have a small part of if you tell them, yes, you have a small part of something that's really huge um, and, and you, know, you may find a niche in this, but, but you're not going to be able to get people to do that unless the, the reward is something more than just you know, getting a paper, or getting a grant and so forth. And, so I actually believe that, that universities are really the only entities that are actually capable of properly framing grand challenges. This is not a universally held view. There are a lot of people that view universities as the worst place to do this. Um, but I, I really do think that, you know, that a place like UCLA or you know, many of the other places that people here come from, 
there are no other places that contain such a diversity of incredibly talented people across the entire spectrum of human endeavors so that you can really get the people that could really devise the strategies to undertake them. Now, actually carrying out a grand challenge is a different story, and it may be that universities are uniquely poorly qualified to carry out the grand challenge. Um, that's something that remains to be seen. But I, I, I really do believe that, that they, are, they are something that really universities, um, they sort of really give a reason for universities to exist, um, even if there were no other one, because no one else could do these kind of things. I really believe that passionately. So the Depression Grant Challenge, which I'm going to talk to you about today, has um, an incredibly ambitious goal. We aim to cut the burden of depression on human health and well-being in half by the year 2050. Um, you know, and, and obviously, we do that recognizing that most of us are either not going to be alive by then or certainly not going to be working on it, um, and to eliminate it by 2100. And, you know, and obviously, by that time, nobody in this room is you know, it's going to be still working. But this is what I mean by really a long horizon that's required to solve something on the scale of essentially cutting out the burden of depression on human health. And so the question comes up, why depression in comparison with all the other things that, you know, that we could have a grand challenge on? And so I'll just give a few different reasons here um, that, that come from statistics. One, it's incredibly common. It affects one in five people over their lifetime. So if you look around this room, that means that you know, there are at least probably 15 people in this room who, if they haven't already experienced it, are going to experience it. Um, it's incredibly disabling. It's actually the number one cause of work and school-related disability in the world. Um, it is incredibly deadly because it's the main reason why people take their lives. And one person dies of suicide every 30 seconds, which is more than die from either homicide or war. Uh, it's incredibly costly. It direct costs to the US economy are over $200 billion a year. If you add in all the indirect costs, it becomes much larger. And there's really a great need to do something like this because at the moment, only half of the patients, even when they do get identified, improve. And so there's a tremendous need to, um, to actually carry this out. I want to just sort of mention um, a couple of other aspects before I actually get into um, sort of the details. The first is, you know, many people and more and more people all the time are aware of the fact that when we talk about depression, we're not talking about the same thing as sadness, which everyone experiences um, and which is, you know, obviously an intrinsic part of the human condition. Depression is a disorder that involves not just extended periods of feeling sad, but involves really, um, really disability, the loss of interest in both work and outside of work activities continuously feeling tired or slowed down to the point where people can't do things, can't concentrate, remember, make decisions, um, feel restless, irritable, lose um, their appetite, don't sleep, and at the most severe level, either think of suicide or actually attempt it. And depression affects all ages, but I, I wanted to sort of mention a couple things that I think are particular valence to the, to the people um, here which is that depression is really an enormous issue among students. And um, here I'm just talking about undergraduate students, but it's actually worse for graduate students. Um, oh, and this is from a survey from a couple of years ago. 30% of all students surveyed felt so depressed at some point that they found it difficult to function. 7% um, seriously considered suicide, and 1% of them had already attempted suicide. And the majority of depressed students have never sought treatment. And then the thing which to me is actually most alarming and you know, most shows why this needs to be talked about is that actually most students who actually do commit suicide are not in any kind of treatment at the time of their death. So we do an incredibly bad job of recognizing the problem, um, you know, far less treating it. Um, and, and so again, I mentioned about what a major cause of um, a mortality suicide is, but in fact, it is the number one cause of death for people between the ages of 18 and 49 years old. So, um, you know, so for people, you know, at the time when they should really be beginning their adult lives and then sort of consolidating their adult lives, or that's the time when they are at most risk from depression. And it has a huge impact on really most of the other diseases that we encounter. Um, it, it worsens both the risk and the course of these. And this is just a graph that shows for people who've had heart attack, 
the difference in mortality in the six months after heart attack between those who were depressed afterwards and those who were not depressed afterwards. And as you can see by the, the blue bars, um, the rate of um, uh, mortality, you know, this is not from suicide, this is just overall mortality after heart attack is far greater in those who are depressed. And you could see the same thing for stroke or, um, or cancer or, or really almost any major disease. So, you know, there are several objectives to this grand challenge, and I'll, I'll give a little bit more um, detail about it, but really, you know, because of the emphasis um, that uh, everyone here has on genomics, I'm going to particularly focus on the goal that I've talked about first, which is, um, which is really to try to understand the cause of depression, for which I believe strongly that like for other common and complex diseases, um, even though genetics is not the full story behind disease risk, it's really the only handle we have to actually begin to get a foothold on trying to understand um, the causes of disease. And so I'll, I'm going to spend probably most of the time talking about that. Um, one of the reasons why depression is so poorly treated is that we understand so little about what actually happens in the brain and the rest of the body when, when people become depressed. And so there's an incredible need to elucidate the neural circuitry underlying depression. Um, because of the fact that so many people don't respond to treatment, even compared to most other diseases, there is an enormous need to find biomarkers that will allow us to predict the course of depression for people individually and their response to treatment. Um, and then beyond the research, um, uh, you know, and as I mentioned with, with the, the thing that I told you about students and suicide, there's an incredible need to both predict and uh, prevent and treat depression. And so the Depression Grant Challenge actually has a major component to do that and to educate the community and so forth. Um, even while we're doing the research that constitutes our main work. Um, and of course, the ultimate goal, as is, as is true for most sort of really large scale biomedical research um, enterprises is to ultimately develop and implement and evaluate new treatments and preventions. Okay, and so really there are four major components of the Depression Grand Challenge um, of which I'm only gonna talk about one today. And so um, while there is an interest um, uh, in this thing that I talk about at the bottom about um, destigmatizing depression, eliminating discrimination, while you know, central to what we do to do the discovery neuroscience that will illustrate what the circuitry underlying depression is, ultimately that will be how we develop new treatments. And while, as I mentioned, um, beginning to treat people on a large scale today using innovative approaches is also incredibly important to what we do. What really sits at the heart of the entire program is a longitudinal study of 100,000 people, which we have just recently initiated, which has the goal of identifying the causes of depression. And this is what I will keep referring to as the 100K or 100,000 person study. Um, so again, there will be a number of outcomes or, or products from, from this 100,000 person study. Ultimately, um, the development of digital health tools, which I will talk about because I think they really are central to the progress we need to do genetic genomic studies of depression. Biomarkers of treatment response, as I mentioned, again, will very much depend on the success of the genomic and genetic studies. Databases of information, um, across all forms of genetic and genomic data and all aspects of depression. And then from all of the above, hopefully biological targets for new treatments. And again, I just wanna emphasize, um, uh, you know, the, the really the incredible multidisciplinarity of this effort um, and, um, uh, you know, ranging from genetics, um, which include not only myself, but hang on, which is the, but Jonathan Flint, who many of you may know, um, clinical people such as Michelle Krask, basic neuroscientists like Larry Zapersky, um, but then um, uh, electrical engineers who are developing digital health solutions. Um, believe it or not, there is a role for computational people um, uh, and, and actually several of the people that have been central in, in this program are, are really the people that are central to us. But then even people, for example, in economics, because we really do want to, um, uh, we really do want to measure the outcome uh, of, of everything that we're doing. 
Okay, so to come back to this 100,000 person study, um, you know, it, it's going to involve a number of different components, but really what I'm, I'm, I really want to emphasize today are, are just a few different aspects of it, which are phenotyping, which includes behavioral tracking, and I'll talk about that at some length, and obviously the genomics, which I won't really talk about at much length, but, but just to sort of introduce. Um, and so the, the way the study is working is that we're screening a total of probably about 2 million people who get their health care or who have any kind of encounter with the UCLA healthcare system. Probably it will also involve screening people who have any connection to the campus, including both students, staff, and faculty. And then from this 100,000 person cohort, we will be obtaining electronic health record data, we will be generating detailed and longitudinal and objective measures of mood and behavior, and so really completely transforming the way that we consider phenotypes for, um, for behavioral disorders, and I'll, I'll talk about that at some length. Um, again, as I mentioned, we will both sequence the genomes and obtain data on environmental exposures, so together I'll hopefully get a fairly comprehensive understanding of uh, cause of depression. And so. Our goal is not just to understand the cause of depression, but as I, I want to try to emphasize, trajectories of depression, because really you cannot understand depression at a single time point. And this is actually a point that I would make for human genomics and genetics in general. Um, almost all the data that we analyze in any of the genetic studies that we do, you know, ranging from small scale studies to things like UK Biobank or, you know, or almost anything that you can think of, is really sort of, even when they're well-designed and fully, you know, sort of prospective studies, they almost all end up being in some ways samples of convenience in the sense that you really get very small snapshots of people's phenotype. And human disease phenotypes, like the rest of human biology, extend over time. And some phenotypes you probably can understand pretty well at a single time point, but for many others you really only are getting such a small piece of the picture that you really have a very little hope of really getting at the full contribution of genetic variation. And so, so the opportunity to do this in a way that we actually can distinguish different trajectories just is, is really um, incredibly important. And um, so, you know, this is probably not a question that needs to get asked for the people here, but it's a question I get asked all the time, which is doing something like this, why have the genetic study actually be the thing that sits at the center? And, and it really um, largely comes down to the point that I'm, oops, sorry, that I mentioned earlier. How do I get back here? Um, um, about getting a foothold on biology, but it really is the only way that I can think of for us to begin getting at what is the incredible heterogeneity of depression, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, to actually be able to, at some point, subtype in a way that, um, that again, advances our understanding of biology. Um, genetics clearly, and we know this throughout biomedicine, offers a scaffold for wider understanding. And I think, in some ways, most importantly, the kind of large-scale genetic study that could be the center of a thing like the Depression Grand Challenge was never feasible before. But really, for the first time, I think it really is feasible for us to say we are going to do a comprehensive genetic study over 10 years of 100,000 people and do it in a way that is affordable and not have people really laugh and say that's just not something that you can do. I think um, that, that just wasn't possible before. And so, you know, I mentioned genetics as a foothold on, um, on biology, and I think there's now incredibly strong data um, to indicate that in the search for new, certainly for new drug treatments, genetics is really the, the best hope by far of being able to do so. So there's a lot of evidence that, um, that even with genetic variations identified um, you know, that are fairly small effect genetic variations, let's say, from GWAS, that, that things that, that turn out to be validated by having that kind of genetic data have a far greater chance of turning out to be successful drug targets than those that are developed through the traditional ways that pharmaceutical companies do it. And, and that's really what, what's shown on this, this graph, is that the, you know, the odds of being able to get successful treatments go up very much and obviously they go up more when you 
get genetic variations of large effect than genetic variations of small effect. But even genetic variations of small effect actually um, have a big impact on predicting drug targets. Um, and this is actually now accepted by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, even three years ago, this was not completely accepted, but really is now, I think, universally accepted. And it's actually even accepted at the level of the FDA. Um, and, and that's in part because of data showing things like the fact that even by the metrics of the FDA, going from phase one to phase two, phase two to phase three, and phase three that to approval, that actually using genetics as the basis of the targets particularly increases the odds at these later and most expensive stages of drug development. So, um, so it, again, it's, it's, it's really becoming incontrovertible, I think. However, one of the reasons why we need a depression grand challenge is because depression genetics really lags behind that of other disorders. And, um, you know, and this shows that this is, um, uh, uh, this is a, um, a paper. That I actually, I don't know if it's a peer. I, I got this off of BioRK from, um, from Pickerel's group. Um, and it was, it was talking about something else, but it, it had this, what I thought was really nice figure, which was showing the current status of, um, from about a year ago of different of meta-analysis for different common diseases ranging from Alzheimer's disease to coronary artery disease to type 2 diabetes and you know showing that for all these diseases the um, the Manhattan plots showed you know multiple genome-wide significant loci for all of these diseases and um, and then what's really remarkable is then when you include depression <laughs> here you see um, you know no Manhattan uh, uh, plot. This is the, I don't know, um, Death Valley plot or something like that. <laughs> um, and so, um, so, you know, it's, it's really striking that the, the lack of success. And, and it's not just that psychiatric diseases are hard. They are obviously hard because the phenotypes have so much less objective validation. But even compared to other psychiatric disorders, depression really lags behind. And this is sort of showing you a contrast with um, the most recent published meta-analysis from the schizophrenia. Um, GWAS of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, you know, where again there are, there are now over 100 genome-wide significant loci, you know, with with pretty large samples. Um, but um, but if you look at the, the sort of the comparable efforts for depression of, of the same group, um, as of the most recent um, sort of summary that I've seen published, which was now about two years ago, you know, at which point there were almost 40,000 cases, and there was possibly one genome-wide significant locus. So really extremely different from what you see in schizophrenia even. And so why are there so few findings for depression? Um, on the one hand, there is intrinsic, it's an intrinsically heterogeneous phenotype. And I'll, I'll show you a slide in a minute that really illustrates this. But really the fact is that depression is a final common pathway for multiple processes. You know, in some ways it's akin to something like fever. You know, in the rest of medicine, nobody is going to do genetic studies of fever because everybody recognizes that fever gets caused by a zillion different things. Um, I'm not saying depression is quite as bad as that, but, um, but it really is a final common pathway. And so if you're going to call all these things depression, you are, of course, going to weaken the power of any genetic study. A second cause of heterogeneity is because we really, at the moment, have very little way, because we have such little um, evidence to start with, to really differentiate which cases are going to be most genetic and which are going to be environmental. But that's beginning to change, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, the phenotyping, and, and this is why I'm going to try to spend um, most of the last part of the talk on this, um, is, has really been incredibly poor even by the standards of this field of behavioral genetics, which itself the phenotyping is so difficult to do. And so you might ask the question, what does it take to qualify as depression for a genetic study? So in fact, the largest number of quote unquote cases in these consortium genetic studies for depression actually come from 23andMe. And so what gets called major depression, okay, so the equivalent of a disorder that, let's say somebody has spent two hours f through an interview trying to diagnose in somebody who maybe has had five hospitalizations and has records, 23andMe gives the same label when they get a response on, you know, to the people who are their customers to either one of the two questions below. 
asking people, have you ever been diagnosed with depression or have you ever been diagnosed with depression by a doctor? And so I'm not saying that many of the people who would answer yes to this don't have depression. Obviously, a lot of them do. But I would submit that there's no evidence that that's the same thing as actually having you know, a real diagnosis or like a real phenotype, if you think about it from a genetic study. And so, in fact, at this point, in the most recent unpublished meta-analysis from this consortium, over half of the cases involved, over 70,000 cases that are being analyzed as depression, are individuals that have just said yes to one of these two questions. So, so those are sort of the obstacles. I mentioned that, that depression is heterogeneous, and, and it's even heterogeneous by definition. So even with the sort of the most rigorous and systematic use of current methods to come up with the phenotype of depression for genetic study. There are sort of eight criteria, you know, some of which I showed you earlier, um, that relate to things like mood, interest, weight, change, sleep, and so forth. But you can have any five of these nine and get exactly the same phenotypic de designation. So, I mean, you know, again, you don't need to do that much computation to recognize the number of different, you know, combinations of of five out of nine that you could get, all getting the same label, but clearly not all reflecting the same information. And, you know, probably in large part as a result of all the things that I've said before, major depression in comparison with a lot of the other complex diseases we study is really only moderately heritable. So, you know, in contrast to schizophrenia, which in typical twin studies has a heritability of something like 70%, um, these, this is sort of a compilation of the different uh, twin studies for, um, for major depression. And you could see that for the most part, the heritability is more in the range of 40 to 50%. And again, that's not saying that's the true heritability of something that is really depression, but that's when you take all together all of these cases that are used in these studies, that's, that's really what we come up with. Um, and here's another indication of the genetic heterogeneity um, is evidence um, that uh, these are from, from two different uh, sources, that genetic susceptibility in twins differs between the sexes. And so again, you know, that's, that's a pretty strong suggestion of heterogeneity. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is only a moderately heritable condition. And that's because environmental exposures are incredibly important. And so I use these two individuals to illustrate the incredible importance of environmental exposures, which for the most part are unknown to us. And um, you know, we can know when individuals are genetically the same. You, know, you can see that these two probably started out life identically, but you can see that they've ended up with different phenotypes. And unless you knew why, you wouldn't know what the difference between them was. And that's almost always the case when we try to tr understand the environmental contribution to a disease like depression. And we're beginning to get some clues to this. And so this is a slide courtesy of our colleague Jonathan Flint from the study that he and his uh, collaborators have done, the Converge study in China. And um, you know, they asked a question that, that um, most studies are essentially afraid to ask, which is they asked everyone in their study their history of childhood sexual abuse. You know, so a really difficult thing to ask people. And they didn't just ask it as a general thing. As you can see, they actually asked people in a very detailed way. Um, and you know, as you can also see, and probably are not at all surprised by, um, this kind of terrible early experience is a really, really strong risk factor for depression but which for 99.9% .9 of all the studies that have ever been done about depression, we have no information that would tell you this is somebody who has a really, really strong environmental exposure reason to have depression and maybe should not be considered the same in a genetic study as somebody who hasn't had that kind of exposure. And again, it seems pretty obvious, but, um, but it, it's just really never been done that way. And so I want to now turn for a few minutes to this Converse study in China because it really is the sort of the thing that, that we use to show us that this can be done. So, um, so Jonathan and his collaborators um, started, I can't remember how many years ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, and um, they developed um, collaborations, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong thing, with, um, with hospitals throughout China, 
Um, and they designed a study which was really tried, designed to maximize the genetic signal. And so as a result, they were able to show the first replicated genetic loci for major depression, as shown by these two um, uh, little bars that, that peak above the genome-wide significance threshold, in which they reported in Nature two years ago. And so I think it's really important to differentiate. You know, I told you about the consortium study that involves the phenotype of somebody answering yes to a question. Well, in contrast, in this study, everyone had to have evidence of recurrent depression, which was severe enough for them to have actually ended up in the hospital. And so again, this is where this, um, you know, this significant result comes from, is from a very much more rigorous definition of the phenotype than in, in what's been done in the field as a whole. Um, and, and so again, you can look at what are the ingredients. Um, I mentioned that there's some heterogeneity between sexes, and so they studied only women. They studied only those for whom there was really clear evidence of recurrent episodes. So let's say somebody who was just depressed because they'd had the breakup of a relationship or they'd lost their job would not probably make it into this category. It's only people who really at multiple times in their life had it. They had to be severely enough affected so that they ended up in the hospital. They had a fairly rigorous way of ascertaining the phenotype. Um, and importantly, because um, there are sort of a number of other variables like substance use that can influence the phenotype. In China, it, it turned out that at least when they started the study that women had a very low frequency of use of alcohol, um, drugs, or even tobacco, and so that they really were able to get a, a, a sort of very pure depression phenotype. And they further found that even on top of this already rigorous approach, that when they, re they um, refine the phenotype further by focusing only on a particular subform of depression called melancholia, which is even more severe, that they began getting a significant increase in the genetic signal. And they further increased the signal, as I mentioned before, when they excluded those individuals who had really strong environmental exposure, um, in this case, the, the childhood sexual abuse. So, you know, that shows that you can actually find loci contributing to depression with all of the implications of that for understanding the disease. But, that, but you know, we know that, that this is going to require much, much larger numbers to really fully, um, um, fully understand the contribution of genetics to depression. It will take very large studies of well phenotype cases. And um, fortunately for us, as we tried to, um, to convince people that 100,000 people was the right size for such a study, there was an editorial in Nature by Steve Hyman, who used to be the director of National Institute of Mental Health, and, um, and I promise I did not plant this, um, saying that to understand the molecular mechanisms of depression was going to require a genetic study of 100,000 people. So that fit very well with, um, with our attempt to show people that that's what we needed to do. So, so, you know, now we are in the process of doing this. We have this first study from China. We have this 100,000 person study that I mentioned is the heart of what we're doing here. And then there's also the continuing efforts of Jonathan and his group in China, which is actually now over the next couple of years going to get up to almost 50,000 people. And so our expectation is that, you know, with the first couple of loci with this first study, that we're going to over the next few years you know, ramp up to the point where we suddenly, you know, a few years from now, we'll have over 100 different loci to try to understand what they mean. So, so that's sort of the overall justification for this, this approach. I want to mention two other things then in the last part of the talk. And how long do we go till? Um, I mean, you can go as long as you want. Okay. I mean, you shouldn't say that. No, no, no. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to, now no, I can go nearly that long. Okay, so, so one point I want to make is, again, I mentioned that this is the big data initiative um, in brain health at UCLA. And so what I want to sort of convey in the next couple of slides is we're already involved in, in very large data sets, but the Depression Grand Challenge is going to sort of increase this by orders of magnitude. So, um, so this is the current number of genomes that, um, that, you know, the group of people that are most involved in large-scale genomic analysis here are, are analyzing at this moment. 
Um, we, we currently have about 16,000 deep whole genomes, which we're analyzing from a number of different studies, you know, and many of the people here are involved in that analysis. Um, but the depression grand challenge, you know, in contrast, so this is what we will be doing five years from now or so compared to what we're doing now. And then in terms of the amount of data that this represents, you can see that, um, that here. Um, and, and again, you know, basically, um, this is going to clearly overwhelm um, uh, sort of both computing and storage if we don't develop better solutions. Fortunately, we are developing better solutions, um, uh, but, but it, it really is a big challenge. Okay, and so now I want to, in the last part of the talk, I've, you know, I've talked about, um, I've talked about the feasibility of doing this kind of genomic study of depression on a large scale. And I've also talked about how the fact that it's really not the genetics and genomics that's the limiting factor in what we learn. It's really the fact that, you know, given that what really determines the power of genetic analysis, you know, and, you know, for example, the effect size of a genetic variant is not a function of the variant, it's a function of the variant in relationship to a phenotype. Right, so if you take the same genetic variant um, and gradually make that phenotype that you're looking at it against more and more precise and biologically distinguishable, the effect size of the variant is going to go up. And so therefore your power to really understand genetic causation is going to go up. And so our view is that yes, getting to 100,000 people is, is a hugely important part of this, but that the most important part of increasing the precision and um, impact of genetic studies for depression is going to come from taking the phenotypes from these incredibly poor ones, you know, take at the really extreme end. And I, I'm not picking on 23andMe. I mean, they're obviously not doing anything wrong there. They just happen to have this as a checkbox in their website. Um, but going from that kind of phenotype through the clinical phenotype, even when most rigorously done, is still incredibly primitive to what we think is going to be phenotype that really, for the first time for behavior in humans, actually takes us to the scale of, of something that you can do on a large scale and get objective, quantifiable information. So, so first, again, I just want to emphasize the importance of the longitudinal aspect of doing this. Understanding depression really requires characterizing trajectories. And this is, again, Nowadays, we tend to do studies at a single time point. Um, you know, decades ago, when all they could do was observe people, um, basically, they tended to do more longitudinal studies. So there actually used to be more information about trajectories decades ago than we have today. And what you could see when you look at these kinds of studies is that when you look at different subtypes of depression and other mood disorders, you begin seeing different patterns of trajectory which we are hypothesizing are going to turn out to be incredibly important when it comes to understanding genetic causation. And again, this is something, these trajectories were recognized at the beginning of the 20th century, but they just did not have the means to do anything about it. And then this really, this approach was really lost as, as large scale epidemiology and genetics got going. And so what we think we need for this 100,000 person study is first a way of doing high throughput phenotyping because it's too expensive to do the sort of standard approach on everyone. Objective phenotyping that don't just re rely on subjective information. Getting phenotypes that really truly capture impairment, which we think will be critical to getting subtyping and doing this longitudinally, which importantly will also give us information about the relationship of depression to other disorders that with which it co-occurs and which will probably also be revealing about the biology of other diseases like heart disease, stroke, and so forth. Okay, so again, our standard assessments are entirely subjective. They've barely changed 100 years. They're the same as if you had gone to get assessed for depression in 1910, you would have been asked a series of questions from which the person asking the question would form some inference about your phenotype. That's really not changed at all. And so what is really fortunate is that um, digital methods, and particularly the, the ubiquity of smartphones, but also other devices, now enable us to get objective assessments of behavior and to do so in a longitudinal way. And so, th so this is the, the last couple minutes I'm going to talk about behavioral health tracking. So from the phone, even if we don't learn anything new or develop any new tools over the next few years, 
we can already get information on sleep, activity and location, um, physiology, environment, speech, which is incredibly important for, um, for depression because it's one of the ways that we most infer what's changed about mood and social interaction, which is of course important. Um, you know, and then gradually, um, incredible information that is going to come from other wearables. So this is, in fact, just an illustration of a smart wristband, um, which is being used by one of our colleagues in en engineering and with collaborators uh, at Berkeley and Stanford, which actually draws metabolic data from sweat. And so enables, you know, in a completely non-invasive way to get information about metabolites, electrolytes, you know, a number of other physiological variables, and, and you know, and this is something that could be scaled to the level of 100,000 people very easily. And so, so just to give some, um, I won't go into any kind of detail about this, but basically, again, existing frameworks, which can be used for both Androids and, and iPhones using open source software, and which gives us information through the vast number of sensors that we all have on our phones. And that allows us to get at a number of different domains, activity, social activity, sleep, emotional state. Um, you know, all of these things are things that we could go into much more detail about, but, but I think the basic idea is that all things that we used to rely on entirely from self-report, we can now begin to get objective information um, that, that really gives us validation for these things. So just to take one example, physical activity, um, you know, clearly when people become depressed, they become less active. Um, and as people become less depressed, their daytime activity um, increases. And, um, and so we can actually measure this. Um, uh, basically, um, we use um, GPS and, and other information. There are a number of different target measures, you know, looking at how far people travel from home each day, the variation in their travel each day, you know, where they're actually going and so forth. We can correlate this to a number of clinical variables that, that are relevant so we can validate this information. And, and this sort of just gives the illustration of this for a, a couple of individuals um, where UCLA is here and you know you can see how it's tracking their movement between where they're starting oops, and, sorry, and UCLA. Um, and, um, and then we can begin to start doing analysis, and this is sort of a very early kind of analysis, comparing depression shown in red with sort of controls shown in blue. Um, you know, again, very small numbers, but you can see sort of really clear-cut patterns where the activity pattern is really very demonstrably different in depression compared to those who are not depressed. And so, you know, this, this sort of data goes into an analytics model that, um, uh, that is sort of still in an early stage of development, but that ultimately, you know, we hope will include the sensor data um, and, um, you know, begin to do classification of behavior to ultimately turn these behavioral measures into a model of depression. And, you know, and so we can begin to see that this kind of continuous objective information um, uh, from, from the phone data and from other kinds of data can begin to replace the subjective information for a number of the indicators of the existing phenotype. And I've shown in blue, I mentioned you know, the, that it's any five of nine. There are several that we can already begin to consider replacing the subjective information with objective information. So I, I really believe this is going to really profoundly change, not just our project, but really the whole understanding of, of human behavior and behavior disorders. It's really going to shift our disease definition from, you know, from the one that has really not changed for decades to one where we really, rather than having this sort of checklist of possible symptoms, we'll have configurations of objective features that we can assay longitudinally. And so ultimately, these will be the target of treatment. Um, biomarkers can be assessed in terms of these features. So for example, if we're interested in assessing a biomarker, rather than doing it as we currently do, where we say, okay, six weeks after starting a treatment, we do a biomarker assay to say who's responding, we can actually assess the biomarker at the time when we're seeing instantly the first biological evidence of, of change in response to treatment. And so our, our hypothesis, obviously we don't know this yet, is that genetic analyses that are focused on these features will be more powerful and will also elucidate trajectories.
Um, so I just summarized, you know, this is the most ambitious project that has ever been undertaken at UCLA. Um, you know, it pushes the envelope in scale of genomics data, as I showed you, in the implementation of this new kind of phenotyping, in analysis of large-scale complex data, you know, taking the complex phenotype data with this unprecedented scale genomics data. And, and I haven't talked about this, but also, you know, offering the opportunity to integrate research and treatment in a much more rapid way than has ever happened before. And then finally, and you know, this is something I would emphasize for, um, you know, particularly for those in the Bruins and Genomics program, this is going to provide an opportunity for faculty and most importantly trainees for at least the next 10 years, if not longer. So thanks very much. I'm sorry I went over a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. So no, I mean it's it's a it's a huge, it's an important question and it's a huge issue. Um, so, you know, one thing that I didn't talk about, but I mentioned right at the end, is the integration of research and treatment. And so, our conception is, is that everything that we've talked about is not just a tool for research, but is actually incorporated into the treatment and um, and and is a tool for treatment decisions. And so we, we only have a fairly small data set at this point, but our experience is that people who appreciate that this is being done as part of their own clinical care have a very different attitude than people who just view themselves as research subjects or as consumers. How to, how to make sure that, that you know, it's the same issue of keeping data secure for any other purpose and the idea is that here it's not like these are data that are going to, um, you know, to Microsoft, but these are data that are going to your healthcare provider. Um, I think people view that as, as a different kind of thing. It's a sense, it's not exactly the electronic health record, but it's, it's not entirely different from it. And voice recognition, yeah, I mean, th there is an incredible opportunity if, if you don't do it um, correctly, you know, to get people very concerned. But if you do do it correctly, you can, I think, make it something that's secure that gives information that can't be gotten any other way. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, a, a very good question. Again, um, very much the latter. Okay, and again, I think that people, the, the studies of depression in general, I think, have really suffered from the fact that they've tended to exclude people that have, they, they tend to exclude people that have other, let's call them primary conditions or co-occurring conditions, and those are the places where depression is both most severe and most likely to occur, and I believe also where we will learn about the biology of depression. So we're very much focused, as I mentioned, this is being done across the UCLA health system. So in fact, our, our starting point is to do this in across all neurologic disorders where the frequency of co-occurrence of depression ranges from about 30 to 60%. Yeah, no, the genetic data, I mean, again, just as with, you know, NIH-funded studies, our goal is ultimately that all those data will be, in, will be publicly available. Um, you know, obviously not in such a way that it would enable people to relate that to the confidential information, but just in the same way that we do for any other study. So this is what I'm doing these days. Yeah. Well, you know, I yeah. say this is what I'm doing. These days. I haven't yeah. stopped doing